Good morning. It is March 1st, 2019, and we are going to talk about why oil investing is dead, but oil trading is going to be a big, big deal for a very long time. And we're going to review something that I said oh, six months ago, probably, and that was that oil stocks are entering their golden age. That's the one thing I didn't preload for you today. Golden. Let's see here. There you go. The new golden age for oil stocks is about to begin, but it's not all oil stocks. It's oil stocks that are able to drill and produce out of cash flow. And they have the balance sheets to do it, and they have the assets to do it. That actually eliminates, in my view, about two-thirds of the oil companies out there. Um, there's a lot of companies that are not going to get financing. There's a lot of companies that have secondary uh, acreage. But if you find those companies with good balance sheets, have the right technology, the right expertise, and they have the right piece of land, they're going to do pretty well. So we're going to cover some of those companies that I think are entering a little golden age period. First, just want to talk about why oil investing is dead. And it basically boils down to, um, at some point in the not unforeseeable future, and it's impossible to be precise at when this point is, but we know now that demand for oil is going to turn over. British Petroleum, Royal Dutch Shell, OPEC, they're all saying the same thing. It's just a matter of when. So Royal Dutch Shell and British Petroleum are now on board with what I've been saying is that the tip over point for oil demand is right around 2030. Now, I call this period in the 2020s the peak oil plateau where supply and demand are basically equal with demand's growth slowly disappearing. So that doesn't mean that demand will disappear, but the growth of demand will disappear. And supply will be managed to be roughly equal to the demand, and that'll keep oil prices a little bit higher. I had anticipated that the, the range for oil prices would be 80 to $120 about four years, five years ago, uh, but technology has improved. So that means that the range for oil prices has dropped to about $60 a barrel to $100 a barrel, and it can go outside of that range for unusual circumstances. And the unusual circumstance that people usually think of is Middle Eastern conflicts drives the price of oil up. I think that'll happen at some point. The other circumstance has been the Saudis and OPEC driving oil prices down. And then in the fourth quarter, we had a perfect storm of money flow issues, which were pensions are in distribution and that's permanent. The Fed was pulling or is pulling $50 billion a month out of the economy, which largely is money coming out of the markets. And then in the fourth quarter, you also had tax loss selling, a record number of hedge funds um, li uh, liquidating. And by the way, foreign direct investment last year, particularly from China, which was a large buyer of equities and real estate, fell off of a cliff. So get all those outflows of money in the fourth quarter last year, uh, which caused that horrible December, the worst December since 1931. So... You have Trump basically tricking OPEC, uh, getting a lot of oil produced, drives the price of oil down. Then you had the money flow issues, drove everything down even further. So that was an out of ordinary event. It doesn't reflect on the fundamentals of oil. All of the traders who say that it does, ignore them. They're, they're traders. Look, I'm a fundamental guy that trades. I'm not a trader that tries to make up fundamentals. There's a difference. So. The fundamentals of oil are very strong based on the CapEx that has been put into long cycle projects over the last four years. That fell off of a cliff. Doesn't look like it's going to come back for at least a few more years, although the Gulf of Mexico looks like it'll have an uptick this year. Long cycle projects um, outside of the Gulf of Mexico 
Guyana, Brazil, a couple of others, probably don't start really cooking until the early to middle 2020s. And at that point, we could accidentally see the oil majors push oil supply above demand. And then maybe this curve for the price of oil affects things a little bit differently because they might crash the price of oil again in the middle 2020s. We'll see. Um, I don't know if Exxon is really going to drill as much in Guyana as they said, or Hess will. Um, I don't know if Chevron's really going to drill as much in Brazil as they say they will. We'll see. But for the next several years, uh, we have this circumstance where uh, all the factors are lining up for oil to be in that 60 to $100 range. I think it's going to creep towards 80 by summertime. Does it get all the way to 80? I don't know. It just missed my $80 forecast for last summer by like three bucks. Could it be a repeat? It could be. At the end of the year, will we see oil prices fall off of a cliff again? Probably not, because this year is shaping up to be an up year in the markets. The Federal Reserve is backing up, uh, backing off, and it looks like there's going to be some sort of, you know, some sort of deal with China, even if it really is just going back to the status quo with minor changes and some more soybeans and oil and gas ordered from the United States to reduce the deficit. If you'll remember a year ago, a little over a year ago, just barely over a year ago, I said that that would be the ultimate outcome. There wouldn't be big deal. There wouldn't be structural changes in China. Ultimately, they would just buy more stuff from us and there'd be some minor changes to IP protections and things like that. That is really shaping up to be the deal. If you're reading Bloomberg or the Financial Times or Wall Street Journal, um, which are the three essential subscriptions, um, then you are getting that story. So I would um, anticipate that we get some sort of what I called somewhere else a fake deal. Um, you know, I've also gone over the no deal scenario where Trump and Z just get so mad at each other that they don't do a deal. Um, but I don't think that's going to happen. I think we're going to get that scenario that I laid out over a year ago that there is more bought from the United States by China, shrinks the deficit, some minor around the edges changes in other things like foreign direct investment into China, opening up their markets a little bit, floating their currency a little bit more, making it a little bit more international, um, IP protections. But Anybody who thinks that China is really going to change how they do things, you know, you haven't been paying attention the last 70 years. China is not going to change how their government operates. So in any case, you know, this curve is a little bit fungible. Um, will oil really fall off in a, a cliff in the 2030s? I do think that it does. And it's not the supply that's a problem. We have enough oil to get to the end of the century pretty comfortably. Um, but that oil would become more expensive over time as the high grading, the first oil drilled is the cheapest oil, and then they move to the next oil, next oil, and the oil gradually gets more expensive. By the 2040s, 50s, somewhere in the middle of the century, oil is very expensive. Doesn't mean that we couldn't use it, but it's expensive. So alternatives become even more attractive, plus the 20 years, or 30 years of technology development. So I'm speculating that right around 2030-ish is when oil demand destruction really starts to occur. That will be after millions and millions of EVs and hybrids are on the road, which means that the ICE cars, the internal combustion engine cars, slowly get retired in the 2030s and 2040s, right? I plan to buy a hybrid. If they ever come out with a hybrid uh, forerunner, I'm all over that because I love the forerunner, but I'd love to plug it in for tooling around town here. So if they can pull that off, um, even with a 60 or 100 a mile battery, just for you know day driving, um, I'd be all over that. Then I can drive gasoline around the country. The emissions on the cars are going down and down and down. So even though I am a tree hugger, um, I feel okay about that. I think technology is going to fix an awful lot of the climate change issues in the next couple of decades. So I'm not a doom and gloomer. Um, I'm just trying to look at it as, okay, how will this probably play out? And I know that if we don't swing too far socialist, 
Uh, we let markets do what markets do, and we let entrepreneurs do what entrepreneurs do, and we just give the right incentives, and we make sure that uh, people who pollute have to clean up after themselves, make sure there's some sort of a carbon tax probably at some point, although I don't even know that's necessary because I think the pricing is going to take care of itself. You know, if, if, we, if we try to be a little bit more hands-off and let the markets and let people solve problems, it generally works out. The more the government gets involved, um, the more people try to push an alternative agenda. You know, that's when, as investors, we have to kind of go, okay, I know what I want, but this is what's happening, and how do I adjust? So my adjustment here with oil is that I'm not really investing in it long term anymore. Uh, I'm looking at oil as a position trade. Me, you know, maybe it gets down to a, some swing trading. But I think that we are now well into the beginning of the end of the oil age. You know, maybe we're finishing up batting practice right now and we're about to get into the game. But uh, we can't look at oil as uh, 20 and 30 year, you know, for I'm going to hold them until I'm retired investments anymore. That we, I can hold them for 10 and 20 years anymore, uh, 10 and 20 years anymore. Uh, it, it just isn't a realistic view uh, because we don't know what changes are coming to the economy and to the energy markets over the next decade. So we have to be fluid. Uh, we have to mind the, um, you know, the, the money flows, and we have to mind, um, you know, what technology and government does that affects things. So how have we started the year? Oil is having the best start to a year ever as OPEC production fell. Now, I cover in this next article that it wasn't just OPEC production, uh, but it's also that Canada, uh, and that was a, a, miss, a typo, they didn't cut exports to the United States, but they didn't cut their production, which brought their inventories down. So you have Saudi Arabia uh, mainly uh, cutting um, their production by a couple million barrels a day, and they'll change that. They'll add back eventually. Um, the rest of OPEC is cutting. Uh, Russia is letting some production drift off. You know, not, they're not capping anything. They're just not drilling as much. So the declines, um, coupled with a little bit less capex, Russia's production is going to drift down just a little bit. Um, but the big one is Saudi Arabia. Um, Canada should come back online here sometime in the summer, would be my guess. And I think they said by December, but I bet it's I bet it's by like August. Um, but we'll see. So, you know, oil is definitely on the path towards 80. Does it get all the way there? I don't know. But these oil companies are very profitable at $60 oil. So if you take a look at some of the companies I talk about in the Dirty Dozen article, and you start looking at their earnings, what you find is that the companies that hedged around $58, $59, $60 a barrel, they're doing just fine. And if oil does get towards 70 and they can hedge in, you know, towards 70, they're going to make a ton of money. And by the way, now that natural gas is catching a bid, uh, they can start selling that natural gas. So they were given natural gas away and flaring it off. What if it becomes an asset to them? That's a lot of money that will drop to the, to the bottom line. And, and how could that happen? Well, in the United States, natural gas exports are going to double this year. Back when I was writing for Market Watch, and I'm, I'm sure you guys, you, you guys can find it, I said five years ago that liquefied natural gas by 2019 or 2020 was going to, you know, we're going to be exporting about 12% of our natural gas. Well, if we only have a 1% or 2% excess natural gas um, demand, uh, supply to demand, and we're going to export 12% of it, we better come up with more natural gas. And that's where shale comes in they can start getting that natural gas to market um, and uh, and probably add to their bottom lines oh and by the way natural gas liquids are going to become more valuable with the IMO 2020 uh, and other uh, emissions programs around the world so these oil companies have a lot of things lining up for them to look pretty good uh, into the short and intermediate term again I covered the long term Eventually, the long-term oil demand goes down. Uh, natural gas will follow it. Um, 
natural gas probably be a decade behind oil. But, uh, you know, we just have to understand that these are not forever investments anymore. We, we have to trade them a bit. And again, I don't mean day to day. I mean, you can if you're good at it, but, you know, 80% of day traders don't really make money. So, you know, I look at this as, okay, let's play it cycle to cycle, time period to time period. And these are the, the dozen oil stocks that I'm pretty happy about. And the reason that I'm happy, and you should read the key points here about oil, um, especially this one, everything, and I just covered this a second ago, everything oil related should be looked at in the context of the end of the oil age, right? You can't spend hundred billion dollars uh, on, on, on long cycle projects if you don't know you're gonna get your money back. It doesn't matter if your break even once it's paid off, this 35 or $40 a barrel, you guys still got to pay off all the money that went into building the rigs. So, you know, we're not likely to see a lot of that because they're aware, right? The big companies and the finance people who do the fa financing are aware that we're maybe a decade out from oil demand starting to turn over. You know, it might be two decades, but they don't know the answer. So they're cautious with how they invest their money. Go ahead and read all of these. Again, this chart I think is very important. It's a little bit fudgeable, but this is basically the shape we'll see over the next 30 years. Is a little, is a, not quite as steep, just stretched out a little, yeah, who knows. So the companies, how do I pick out oil companies? Uh, and I actually have this in somewhere else. There's only 19 oil companies, EMPs, that are buying back shares, as well as reducing debt. So that means that these are companies that are producing really good shareholder yield, reducing debt, buying back shares, and, and paying dividends. That's where shareholder, shareholder yield comes from. Who's at the top of the list right now? Devon Energy, because they just had a monster buyback initiated in the last quarter, three quarters of a billion dollars a share bought. In the last year, $3 billion worth. Um, Hess was on the list. Um, Conical Phillips, Pioneer, EOG, Parsley, Concho. So you can see where I'm getting my some a lot of my companies from. We're gonna just buzz through these real quick. Permian. Why the Permian? It's the cheapest, easiest to get to oil in the, in the United States. When the last couple pipelines are built late in the second half of this year, they're gonna have no sweat getting that money out of there. The price differential is going to shrink dramatically. Uh, it already has started because one of the pipelines got, I believe, reversed recently. Um, so they have a pretty easy path of getting oil, not only to the Gulf of Mexico, Mexico but you, you realize, uh, and we've talked about this, is that because our refineries are geared more towards medium and heavy sour crude, uh, we're doing oil swaps with uh, Mexico. We send them light, sweet crude, and they send us some of the heavier stuff. And that's why I like a couple of these companies, is they have things other than light, sweet crude. <coughs> Most of these companies do produce light, sweet crude, and the demand for light, sweet is going up, has to do with emissions, has to do with uh, being able to make it in the gasoline or diesel. But there is a demand for medium, uh, which is largely in the Gulf. We get some Gulf uh, uh, mediums, heavies, light heavies. It's, 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 there's a chart for this. Um, and then Louisiana has some uh, some slightly heavier grades. But IMO to uh, 2020 for the ships is reducing um, uh, I forget exactly what it's reducing to, but basically um, the ships have to use cleaner fuel. So I, I forget the numbers off the top of my head, uh, but it's pretty dramatic. So who do I like in the Permian? Well, I talk about Occidental Petroleum all the time. Um, I've, I've been studying the company literally for 20 years and they have just fantastic management. Uh, they pay a dividend yield. And the reason I favor them over Exxon and Chevron is that Exxon and Chevron both have significant legacy problems that I'm not convinced that they'll be able to get over without having to take some very drastic actions. 
Um, and those drastic actions might work out um, more likely for Chevron than Exxon, I think. Um, I think Exxon really is going to have a problem here at some point just because these companies are so big and they have so many assets and so much debt that for them to sustain themselves once oil prices drop uh, is going to be very, very difficult. And the weird thing is about it, if Exxon and Chevron pursue long cycle projects, they're going to be perpetuating the drop in oil prices. So I think they're kind of in a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. I don't think there's anything imminent bad about them, but they're not leading the market. Exxon has trailed everything for 20 years. Exxon is just not a good investment. Their stock doesn't go up. So it chops along, it pays a 3% dividend. I don't want to be, have equity risk and, and climate change risk and technology risk and all the other risk that comes with the Exxon stranded asset risk. I don't want that risk for a stock that's not going up because it has some sort of growth to offset all those things. Exxon doesn't have that. Chevron is a little bit better at it. Uh, structure of the company is a little bit better. Um, but again, I can find better alternatives. Occidental will grow faster than Exxon and Chevron and pays out a nice healthy dividend. And they have a uh, carbon capture uh, program that you know is going to do very well. Uh, I think it's. I don't think it's valued in the price of the shares. At some point, it's going to, you know, be one of those catalysts. And um, the, again, the focused portfolio is preferable to the gigantic portfolio of assets. Keep that in mind. If you think that huge diversification of assets is a benefit anymore, then you're not accepting that the oil age is at the beginning of the end. Uh, having a ton of assets doesn't help anymore. It's just adding to expenses that may never be recouped. Devon Energy, we saw at the top of the list for shareholder yield, buying back a ton of shares, uh, paying a dividend, uh, reducing debt, um, they have great assets in the Permian, um, in Oklahoma, in the Stack Scoop, Eagle Ford, and this Powder River Basin. Um, think of it like the Bakken, I guess. Uh, you know, it's it, it's just they're just starting to tap it. Them, Chesapeake Energy's in there. Uh, it's turning out to be a really good asset. Is it going to be a good asset for ten years or five years? I don't know, but you know, five or ten years they'll make money on it. Pioneer Resources focusing their portfolio on the Permian, right? Selling all of their other assets, buying back shares, shareholder yield, reducing debt, starting to pay a dividend. And Kana, merger with Newfield. And I'll tell you something about some of these analysts that don't like the Encana Newfield merger. They're stupid. They're just stupid. And I, I understand that they're tasked with looking one year forward, and most of them are you know, accountant types who have never run a business or even studied how a company actually works. That's why 80% of the analysts, you know, don't beat the market. Um, this merger makes a ton of sense. Um, and Khan is now one of the premier unconventional producers in America. Uh, the synergy and cost improvements of combining these two companies, being able to reduce their CapEx and still maintain growth um, it, it's all pretty exciting and they still have a couple of assets that they're going to sell and that'll be cash at fault to the bottom line. Uh, they're also a clear buyout target. Like I said, Royal Dutch Shell described them before the merger, you know, to a T and then they did the merger. So I think they clean up some of the uh, non-core assets, selling them, putting the cash in their pocket, return it to shareholders. And then maybe there are buyout targets down the road, but I really actually look at Encana, not so sure that the buyout story is as great anymore, but I think the ability to churn out cash is really taken off. And um, we saw that they beat earnings uh, by quite a bit yesterday. Contro Resources, not at the very top of my list, but another Permian play. And um, you know the reason they're not at the very top of my list is that they still have more work to do on their balance sheet. Uh, but it's a company that if you're building a basket, it depends on how big your basket you want, want it to get. 
Do you want to own a half a dozen oil stocks? Do you want to own a dozen oil stocks? If you want to own a dozen, you're starting to get into the range where you want Contro. Um, if you want to own 20 oil stocks and really create your own alternative ETF, uh, oil ETF, for sure it, it belongs in there. But um, it, it's barely in the top dozen for, in my view. Uh, but again, very good company, Permian uh, um, a producer. I think it's a, a buyout target um, because they probably look at their uh, equation as, okay, we can do this. We can do the CapEx. We can produce, but we have all this equipment and all these people. Would it be better for us to merge by, with, you know, pick a company on this list? or allow ourselves to be bought out by Chevron. Um, Chevron's gonna buy more Permian oil plays. They've already said so, and I think Exxon does too. Um, Total, uh, the, other, the other global um, players probably gonna try to get in there. Uh, Stat Oil, which has a new name, Endeavor maybe. Um, you know, they, they could be in there, we'll see. But Concho is probably gonna do well on their own and there's a chance that they get bought as well. Um, some of these other companies, Parsley and Centennial, I kind of put them in a basket together. They're smaller, focused on the Permian, and I think they'd be great bolt-on acquisitions. Um, I don't know if Mark Papa is in it for the long term or he just wants to flip it and make a buck. Hard to know. Uh, he made a move towards being more profitable versus growing faster uh, this week and the market punished Centennial, I think that you want to buy an oil stock right now, you, you buy Centennial or you sell cash secured puts, and when it starts moving up in the next couple of months, you start taking a look at calls. Um, this company is going to make money, and uh, they have good acreage, they have good balance sheets, uh, they have amazing leadership. Uh, and when I say that, Mark Papa came from EOG. What is EOG known for? EOG has got one of the lowest, maybe the lowest um, cost per barrel in the industry. They're very good at what they do. And they have various operations around the country. Um, I think it makes sense to me that they'd sell some of this, uh, but we'll see. Um, EOG is a company that again, uh, depending on the type of investor you are, are you looking for more uh, steady, a little bit less volatility? I think you probably go EOG. If you're looking for the bigger bang, Centennial, Parsley, and Kana, uh, Devon Energy is just super solid. I think it belongs with anybody. Uh, I know there's people who still rip on Pioneer. Their their assets are good. You know, none of these companies do well if the price of oil is below $60 a barrel, right? They hang in there, but they don't really return cash to shareholders. But at $60 a barrel and up, some of these become cash uh, machines. And uh, when you throw in the extra natural gas profits, uh, revenues, and NGL revenues, right, these are new sources of revenue that they're going to have over the next couple of years, and that's going to be very positive. Other stocks that aren't Permian focused, and again, EOG isn't necessarily Permian focused, but I think they may move to being focused on Oklahoma and Texas at some point by selling some other assets. So I put them up here. They could very well be down in this list. Um, Hess, Hess Corporation, not really a giant shale play. They sh sold their uh, Permian to Exxon. Uh, but they have pretty good operations in the Gulf of Mexico, which produces different grades of oil. Uh, and Hess is one of the companies that is returning gobs of cash to shareholders, right, buybacks, and a little dividend and reducing debt. Reduced debt by six hundred and thirty three million. So, so you know some of these companies that are reducing debt by a ten, you know, Devon over a billion dollars, you know, Hess. You, know, you take a look at some of these, and you're like, wow. You know, Conical Phillips, $5 billion they reduced it by. So these are the stories here. Conical Phillips, a little bit more diversified. Hess, a little bit more diversified. 
Continental Resource is not diversified. They're a shale play, and he doesn't hedge very much. Uh, Harold Hamm is bunny, buying shares hand over fist. My suspicion, given that he's an older dude, is that he's looking to sell Continental Resources finally. And so he's buying as many shares as he can. And on the next rally, next year, two or three, I kind of get the impression that Ham is looking to cash out. Nothing, you know, I've met the guy once. I don't know anything about him other than, you know, he likes eggs and bacon. Um, but uh, it seems that a lot of things make sense that he would try to cash out. So because they don't hedge, you really don't want to own Continental when the uh, price of oil is going up. Or is that a higher plateau? When oil's down in the 50s and 40s, Continental gets crushed. All right. And finally, here's a stock I've been in for a very long time, in and out of. Chesapeake Energy, you've been trading it 15 years, sometimes profitable, sometimes not. And I believe that Chesapeake has finally started to turn the corner. Thought that a couple of years ago, and that didn't quite happen because oil prices fell. You know, the two, the two oil price crashes, um, several years ago and then again this in the fourth quarter crushed the share price but lo and behold uh chesapeake is rocking and rolling because even with the share price of oil uh falling in the last quarter uh, they hedged at about 59 dollars a barrel and they're doing pretty good so let's start and work our way from the bottom up chesapeake energy up again so it's up what 20 percent in the last week i think that the money flows look pretty good, and we want to use multiple time frames. So not only do we want to look at 20-day uh, look back, right? So shaken money flow formulas, 20 time periods. These are weekly time periods, and then these are daily time periods. So basically, they're looking back over 20 weeks here uh, and trying to find some relativism. Pretty strong money flow into the stock. both time frames. You know, so you get this little dip here, even though we saw that the weekly never really did much dipping, right? There's there's this good money flow. And a little pullback, right? Is is I think buying opportunities. Although this MACD just really crossed over. I think Chesapeake, they might have a little rally in them here right there. Now, ultimately though Goldman Sachs said that they could turn into a cash flow machine. I think that merger was very good that they did. Uh, it gave them a lot of synergies, gave them more contiguous uh, land areas, gave them a couple things that they can still sell. Um, I've always thought that Chesapeake was a $20 stock uh, up until about five years ago. And I was like, okay, it's a $15 stock, $10 stock. Where I think Chesapeake's headed, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, right in that range. Um, and remember, the Marcellus, uh, where they have natural gas, uh, ultimately is going to feed the East Coast more and more, and they they haven't really had to put a lot of CapEx into it while maintaining production. So as goes the price of natural gas, that's your kicker for Chesapeake Energy, along with a pretty good natural gas liquids business. Any Chesapeake questions? No? All right. Continental. Okay. Not the greatest uh, money flow. But it is drifting up over a longer time look. So I think that Continental, you can buy it right here. I think this is about as low as it's going to go. Uh, presuming the price of oil goes up, we'll get one of these rallies like the first half of last year. And I think they probably get back to this 60-something range. You know, what does, uh, does the top out? I don't know. Maybe it hits the top. But I think for sure you're going to see it get to the 200-day moving average and go through it. By summer would be my guess. Conical Phillips, a little bit more steady eddy. Um, not getting a lot of money flow in the very short term. But again, another one of these stocks that turned up at the end of December for people who are interested in buying it. So you're value investors. 
if you are a dividend guy and you want a little bit more diversification, get a little dividend here. They're buying back shares. Uh, they're reducing debt. Um, I think any pullbacks are viable. I think probably, you know, next week, if there's no trade deal, you might get a little downturn. But I don't know. I think that these are all poised to break out. I don't think you should look at these as caps anymore. You know, rising, price of oil's rising. I think most of these break out. Hess, uh, pretty exciting company. Again, a little bit of pullback in the last couple of weeks, which I talked about a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but there's value buyers out there. That longer term time frame on money inflows indicates that there's somebody who wants to buy it. Right? Somebody's buying it. Comes back a little bit. Price is starting to drift up. Looks like there's going to be a breakout here. Again, 60s or 70s. Not huge gains here. But again, for folks who want a little bit more steady eddy and just to be in the market, little dividend, returning cash to shareholders. Um, but I, again, I think all these stocks break out. It's just what kind of magnitude are you looking for and how much risk are you willing to take? EOG, again, short-term pullback. You look at the weekly, drifting upwards. I think this really, I think this really rallies here. I, I think EOG is, uh, if you want a big, if you want a big one, EOG is, is is one of the ones to take a look at. Let's skip over to Pioneer because they're similarly big. Look, somebody likes the Permian, right? Look at that. That's nice. Just starting to get that MACD crossover. Not anywhere near overbought. I think Pioneer could have a mega rally. You see this sucker go back up to 200 by summer. So I'd rather have Pioneer than Conoco or uh, maybe not Hess. I, I like Hess's diversification. I think that's a good one to drop in a bigger portfolio. But uh, I like Pioneer over EOG and Conoco for sure. I like that they're focused on the Permian. Um, I like what they're doing with their balance sheet. I, I just like everything they're doing. Higher oil prices, to me, um, Pioneer is a better longer-term play than Continental. Continental is going to be more volatile. But these guys, when they start churning out cash, there's going to be a lot of it. And uh, they have a pretty good piping system in the Permian. I think they're going to make some money on natural gas. I, I like Pioneer. Did I say I like Pioneer? I like Pioneer. Let's go to uh, let's go to Devon Energy. They're doing everything right. Still, last couple of weeks not so good, but when you take a look at a longer term time frame, money's going in there. Got that positive MACD that just came to you, right? Got a little bit overbought. Came back. I think that. There you go. I think you're going to see a rally up to the 200-day. Not too short order. Um, does it hit it and go through, or does it bounce around a couple times? I don't know. probably bounces around a couple times. Um, but uh, if the price of oil keeps drifting up, these guys are going to make a lot of money. And, again, great assets, natural gas, natural gas liquids. There's going to be new revenues for a lot of these companies in the next couple of years. Added revenues. Accidental Petroleum, we talked about. Again, a little bit of pullback here in the last couple of weeks. Again, when we forecast that, we got that one right on the nose. But look at that. Pretty good. Starting to get that MACD crossover. Just starting. It's been flirting. Not anywhere near overbought. This is one that I think breaks out. Um, I think this one really gets up towards 100. I think they break out of this. I think they're up here in the next year or so. And, and this could happen much faster. Um, somebody was asking me about buying calls and leaps. Because the oil market is so volatile, and when you take a look at the pricing of the options, I just don't think you want to pay for a lot of time value if you're going to buy calls. So you have to be very good on the technical side. Make sure the price is moving in the direction you want it to. Don't try to catch those falling knives. Uh, wait for prices to turn in your direction. 
And then I would be buying smaller, uh, not smaller, but shorter duration calls. Um, and then you just have to commit to rolling them over from time to time. But when you consider the cost of rolling them over versus buying a lot of time duration on a leap, you're better off rolling them over periodically. Uh, selling leaps is actually something that I've been thinking about lately uh, on different things. And uh, you're paying so much for that time value. There's some potentially ways to lock in 20 and 25% gains just by selling leaps and then, um, <clears throat> you know, buying buying a uh, you know, sell sell a put, sell a leap, you know, and you just spread them out. There, there's ways to use the calendar, and and, and the different uh, instruments on the option side where, you know, it's really hard not to make money. So you have to have a big enough account to do it though. Uh, and I don't advocate using margin because you're just gonna get in trouble. And most people get in trouble using margin. If, if you haven't been trained, you haven't used it a lot, you're not experienced, I'd say skip the margin. All right. Let's see, control. All right, down to three companies. A um, couple of uh, questions here about reducing leverage. Yeah, so when something gets overbought, you generally want to reduce leverage. So take a look here. Probably reduce leverage. Well, when we talked about this in July and August, I wrote those articles about you know doing some trimming and selling. Um, and this is right about where we did it. So yeah, you want to reduce leverage when something gets overbought because it's probably going to snap back on you. And don't get greedy and try to get every penny. You made money on the way up. You got overbought. Sell it to somebody who's hyperactive. And kind of share price, like nice basing, drifting up, kind of chopping along here. But I bet this looks pretty good. Oh, yeah. There's buyers in there. Getting the crossovers. So that weekly is already crossing over. That means the daily's coming. It's not overbought yet. So yeah, I, th I see him kind of making a, a, a run at 10, 12 by summertime. That'd be my guess. Again, all dependent on trade deals, things like that. But if we get the fake deal, I should just call, start calling it the fake trade deal. If we get a fake trade deal, um, I think most of these do pretty well. And Khan has got great assets. That new field uh, acquisition slash merger was just dynamite for them. They're going to sell a couple of those assets and just drop billion dollar checks to the bottom line. I don't know what isn't to like about Encana, to be honest with you. It's just, just a great company. Been very well run in their transition over the last five, six years. Um, again, I think all these prices come back. And in short order, maybe by this summer, perhaps by next summer, but um, coming soon. So I think that this is one where I'd be a call buyer. Parsley Energy and Centennial, I'm going to finish up with these two because I think they're kind of similar. Um, Parsley, they're both Permian plays. Um, they're both a little smaller, right? Five billion. For Parsley, Centennial is way smaller. Two, oh, half as big. Um, and Centennial got crushed because they basically said, hey, we're going to work on profitability versus growth. I don't know why the analysts would, 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 would crap all over this company for that. You should be buying Centennial right now. That's just all there is to it. You ought to be buying Centennial right now. Not only are they going to be a growth play, but they're a takeover target. Just bottom line. And I see, you know, I see this going back into the 20s, and you can buy it for under 10 right now. What more do you want? Oh, here. Let's, uh, right? That is as extreme as you're going to get. Act D is going to look horrible. So 
the one I didn't pre-build, apparently. All right, money fell, fell off a cliff. Now it's at an extreme low. Oversold. MACD got crushed. It doesn't have that chart yet. Tell you what. Here you go. This is a gift from the markets. This is a, a gift from the analyst morons. That gap is going to fill back to the upside. You just got to wait for it. Months, year and a half, I don't know. But if I told you, hey, this one's going to make 30% um, in a year, would you be okay with that? I think it's almost a sure thing. So I'm looking at Centennial. I have to look at my positions today, I might add. All right, Parsley. Uh, I prefer Centennial based on pricing right now. Parsley is an awfully good company too. Take a look. I linked to all of their presentation pages. Read all 12 of these and you'll start to understand deeply. And it, they're, they're 20 minute reads, you know, take, take an afternoon you'll really truly start to understand that these companies and where their money is going to come from. All right, let me take a couple of questions and we're about ready to be done. Um, on the oil majors, yeah, I, I've studied all these oil majors. So Exxon and Chevron, I think Exxon's the worst one. Chevron, not too far behind them. BP and Shell, right, they're turning their attention to natural gas. However, they're gigantic companies. And as oil and natural gas start losing pricing power sometime in the next decade, these companies are gonna have a very hard time transitioning. Total is already looking at 10 and 20 years down the future and trying to make those changes. And they're a value buyer. When they buy an asset, they're looking for it cheap. They're looking for something that they can get because it wasn't a core asset from somebody else, but they can bolt it onto something they already do. I like Total better than all the other oil majors. I like that they're diversified into utilities. I like that they're into alternative energy, big shareholder, like 60, 65% of Sun Power. Um, you know, they're doing more in Europe with the alternative energy, uh, the grid space. Uh, Total is doing today what all these other companies are gonna have to face doing tomorrow. Can you make money on, on Shell and BP in the short run? Yeah, probably. Shell pays a, a pretty dandy dividend. I guess they'd be my second favorite. Um, but BP, you know, here's the thing with BP. They have an ingrained culture there that screws up repeatedly. I don't know why they screw up repeatedly, but they screw up repeatedly. I would expect another screw up from BP. I just don't really want to invest in their management. Um, so there you go. I'd actually put Chevron above BP. So there you go. Um, we'll talk about tech stocks another time. Kinder Morgan versus Enbridge. You know, I think they're go, both going to do okay. You know, when, when Kinder Morgan was 15, I said it would double. And it's, what, 20-ish? I'm not sure. What's, uh, what's Kinder Morgan? At 20-ish, 19. Um, Enbridge has had a nice rally. Actually, that's not what you asked about. ETP, Energy Transfer, Transfer Partners. Is that the right symbol? You mean Energy Transfer, right? Oh, yeah. All right. You know, I don't know. I'd have to I have to think about this. I mean, I'll write a piece about the uh, MLPs. How's that? I'm not really sure. Let's see right now. Um, so emerging markets, I look at individual markets. So there's a symbol Vietnam Vietnam. There you go Vietnam. I like some of these plays. And I haven't been real aggressive with them. You know, maybe I, 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 you know, I was talking about these guys last summer. You know, 
they're volatile enough that you have to trade them based on the technicals. Um, I like India long term, but again, I mean, when you take a look, awfully volatile, right? You know, especially when you look at it here. Whoa. But even over five years, it's, it's pretty all over the place. Will it get back into this range? I don't know. You know, it's one thing I'll tell you. Everybody wants to talk about the next financial crisis. Next financial crisis is probably pretty far away. Doesn't mean we can't have bear markets in between. Next financial crisis has something to do with the baby boomers. It's probably a decade off, give or take. So in the meantime, find your 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 good stocks to trade, which I think in the short term and maybe intermediate term are oil. Eventually I'm gonna short oil, not anywhere close. I'm gonna short coal probably starting next year. Um, if the political climate keeps up. Um, but really the sustainable economy is, is where I think ultimately we're headed. And we have to pick our spots carefully in this changing world. So it doesn't just mean alternative energy. It means everything that's part of the smart world, everything the smart everything world, smart grid, smart buildings, smart cars, artificial intelligence, augmented reality, which has incredible industrial uses. You go right down the list, IoT, 5G, you know, quantum computing at some point. Anything that impacts everything else is important. So different types of technology. So we'll go into that in the future. All right, we kept it under an hour today. I hope everybody has a wonderful weekend. And um, pick your spots on oil. Build your basket with enough companies so you don't get too concentrated. Um, but mind your asset allocation. I still wouldn't put more than a quarter of my money into energy. Um, and 12% and is still double weight. So keep that in mind. You know, Figure out what asset allocation makes sense for you. Mind your leverage. Use the overbought, oversold, basic indicators. You, you know, if you're using um, uh, Bollinger Bands, remember, big alligator claws, they eventually close. Keep that in mind. All right, let you go. Take care. Bye-bye.